What is my favorite investment trust? Well, I'm going to reveal all in this short video. Here's a chart of the performance of my favorite investment trust. And as you can see, it beats Fundsmith and it beats Global Trackers. And it's also to be found within the global sector. So first of all, we need to consider what is an investment trust? Well, it's a company quoted on the stock market that invests in assets such as other companies that could be quoted or unquoted, bonds, commodities, properties, even wacky things like song royalties. There are a fixed number of shares in issue, so the investment trust is closed-ended and there aren't large outflows from the trust when markets falter. That means it's much more of a long-term portfolio for the manager. However, the price of an investment trust is set by supply and demand, so there can be a discount or even a small premium to net assets, which would then be the most recent value of the holdings. And this can be quite frustrating if your investment trust suddenly moves to a large discount. And dividends can be paid from the reserves of the investment trust, which gives greater reliability for dividends over a longer period of time. So currently, investment trusts aren't so popular. Some investment trusts have income objectives, but with rising interest rates, you can get a good return on a much less risky proposition, such as cash in a savings account. Investment trusts can borrow money, but if these borrowings renew at much higher rates, then that will hit returns in the future. And finally, some investment trusts have business models that are starting to look decidedly dodgy, with the worst being something like Home REIT, where it was providing accommodation to tenants who then just weren't paying the rents. So what would be the ideal criteria for an investment trust? We would include competitive fees, ideally no performance-based fee, track record of over 10 years, a discount management policy to lower volatility. So that means that it buys back its own shares if they're trading very cheaply. Large enough scale such that the management of the company actually care what happens. And that's what I call a flagship fund. Many managers have several funds and a lot of those funds they don't really care less about. Also, the investment trust needs to have sufficient liquidity so you can invest in a decent scale. It needs to have holdings that match the remit of the fund. So it does what it says on the tin and it needs to have manageable debt. And if it's got all those, then it's worthwhile looking into in a bit more detail. So here we have some data on some global investment trusts. None of them beat a global tracker over a five year period, but two beat a global tracker over a 10 year period. So the problem with investment trusts is that they can lack consistency. With a tracker, you always have the winners. And with an active fund, you sometimes have the winners because there's often some sort of style, some sort of factor bias. And if that bias is in favor, then ka you're cashing in. But if it's not, then you're weeping into your pint of beer. So my favorite investment trust is JP Morgan Global Growth and Income. And here we can see its performance in the blue line. And it's been pretty solid over the last five years. Um, it beats Fundsmith and it beats a global tracker such as the Vanguard Developed World X UK. And to me, it seems like it's got fairly stable performance. It's a pretty solid performer. I find graphs a bit misleading, but here's the calendar performance number two of JP Morgan Global Growth and Income versus its benchmark, which is a global tracker. And we can see that in most years, most calendar years, JP Morgan Global Growth and Income has beaten its benchmark. So one thing that I really like about JP Morgan Global Growth and Income is the team of analysts behind it. It's got 91 analysts. They don't work solely for the fund, but they produce analysis that the three fund managers can then tap into to find the long term structural winners. And this large team, I just wonder how many analysts Fundsmith has, even though Fundsmith has 200 million pounds of income from investors each year to spend on research. So the other problem is that investment trusts, they're all kind of fishing in the same pond and you have to have 
some kind of edge that sets you apart, that makes you worth investing in. And I think that JP Morgan Global Growth and Income does have kind of a slight edge to it. So the size of JP Morgan Global Growth and Income is 1.8 billion. So there's more than enough liquidity there. The fees are tiered, so they're coming out at about 0.5% a year. So higher than Scottish Mortgage, but half that of Fundsmith, and there's no performance fee. The dividend policy is 4% of net asset value. Dividends are paid quarterly, and we've got the dividend history here from 2018 when there was a change in the dividend policy, and the dividend is followed partly from income from the investments that the investment trust is making and partly from its reserves. So the philosophy of JP Morgan Global Growth and Income is that if you only invest in companies paying a 4% dividend yield, you won't get much capital growth. But if instead you invest in global leaders, partly with an eye on dividends, and then pay out the residual to give you the 4% yield from reserves, then you'll get a much better total return. Here are the top 10 holdings, which represent just over a third of the fund. There's about 60 companies in total that are held. We've got Microsoft number one, Amazon number two, um, some fairly familiar names in here. Um, so it's slightly more diversified than Fundsmith uh, and then less diversified than your bog standard global tracker. Here's the country split of the fund. So JP Morgan Global Growth and Income see US companies as particularly resilient with strong brands, strong earnings, and they see risk in Chinese companies, hence they are underweight emerging markets, although that might change. And at the moment, it's quite interesting to note that they're fairly heavily into cash. So interesting to see where they deploy that. The dividend policy of the investment trust combined with low fees and good performance mean that the trust often trades at a premium to its net asset value, meaning that it can issue shares and expand. And then the board also have a discount management policy where they will buy back shares if the discount is 5% or more, and they will try and narrow the premium if that gets to 2% or more. So this is a really useful way for an investment trust to manage itself in favor of the investors. Here's a chart of the premium or discount in asset value over the last three years. And believe it or not, for an investment trust, this is pretty good. If portfolio construction really interests you, then check out my website, www.ianshadrack.com slash portfolio dash coaching, where I offer a service where we can really go deeper into understanding some of the best open-ended funds, investment trusts and ETFs to put together a portfolio that really suits your investment criteria. So my conclusion is that if you like the dividend policy of JP Morgan Global Growth and Income, then it's well worth considering. I think the fees are reasonable, it manages the discount in asset value, the performance is good and consistent, beating its nearest rival, Scottish American. It's diversified with more fund holdings and fundsmith without holding everything, including the kitchen sink. It taps into a large research team. So really it has the advantages of an investment trust without the disadvantages. Check out my investment trust playlist and also have a look at this next video, which I think you'll find really interesting.